Did you know that more than 80% of the oceans are unexplored? The Nautilus is a ship with the Ocean Exploration Trust that is studying these unexplored areas. They are making new discoveries in geology, biology, and archaeology while conducting scientific exploration of the sea floor. Part of their mission is sharing their work for some amazing educational opportunities. One of the programs they offer is a live ship-to-shore interaction. We participated in this program and got to visit with Nautilus team members Ashton Jackson and Christopher Klaus while they were exploring a remote area in the Pacific. We learned about the ship, their equipment, their mission, and why exploration is important and some about what life is like on board. They were kind enough to let us record our session so we could share it with you. Good morning from the Nautilus. Um, Good morning. We are on a ship right now. This is what our ship looks like right here. Oop, I should make that full screen if I can. There we go. So this is the Nautilus and we are actually in this box right up here, the highest cabin area on the deck, I think, or even a little higher than the bridge, uh, or the, our box is a little higher than the bridge. And then this big uh, sphere in the back, this is how we're talking to you right now. It's a big antenna that connects through satellites. Cool. So we are able to talk to you from the middle of the ocean, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, so we are currently in the middle of the North Pacific Sea. We are sailing through the, hold hold tight with me, I promised I'd say this, the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. I believe it's the largest marine national monument in the world. It's definitely the largest one uh, that includes any U.S. territory. And it's just uh, an extension, an underwater extension of the volcanic Hawaiian islands. So we are just about as far from humanity um, as you can get on planet Earth, <laughs> besides the island of Hawaii and maybe certain places on Antarctica. And so it's pretty cool that we've got this live connection, this live video feed. Yeah, we left from Oahu, which is way down here, and we sailed underneath sort of just south of most of the islands uh, in the Pacific change there's there's a bunch of sea mounts but there's also uh, mountains that have broken through the surface and so there are small islands a lot of them have some cultural and religious significance to the people of Hawaii and after we got through m most of it uh, we turned north and there's this branch of sea mounts that we don't know a whole lot about yet um, they're all underwater as far as I know um, and we have traveled up to the the top ones to avoid some weather. We were down here earlier and uh, the weather is kind of bad and the ship was rocking all over the place and we weren't able to do our dives because the sea was so rough we couldn't um, send out our ROVs and things. So we've been doing a little mapping uh, with sonar along the way. We can talk about that in a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about why we're Chris, here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just going to ask on that map really quickly. There's that, so it's an underwater chain of 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 mountains or or something which you said were connected to the Hawaiian Islands. Yeah. Are they active volcanically or are they dead? No, the most active uh, spot in the Hawaiian Islands is over here in uh, the Big Island in Hawaii. Um, the there's a hot spot which is a sort of thin place underneath the the crust or thin place in the crust where the mantle gets a lot closer to the surface and it sort of leaks out and when it leaks out it makes volcanoes but as that's been happening the plate has been shifting um, from east to west and a little bit to the north and you can see the direction so these islands like midway island up here um, has used to be over that hot spot but then over millions of years it shifted and so now these islands that you see in the green are the ones that are over the hot spot so that's where the active volcanoes are and so there's this other chain of seamounts that we don't sort of understand quite exactly how they formed or when they formed. And that's one of the things that we're looking into right now. So we're exploring these uh, unnamed, unmapped seamounts. And the reason we're doing that is because if you look at these sort of uh, yellow outlined areas, there's uh, 
a bunch of these are the yellow outlines are the areas that the United States has control over those water spaces. Um, they're around the US islands and the US mainland. And the red indicates places that we have not yet mapped. So even in our own US waters, we haven't made a map of the seafloor yet. And that's one of the things that we are working on doing in addition to going up close and personal and finding out what's there. And so this is what a seamount looks like. And if you had to guess, what do you think the colors would have to mean on, on this map? What do you think those colors mean? That looks like a weather map in Oklahoma. We know a lot about weather in Oklahoma. <laughs> what do you think the colors mean? Think it's elevation or temperature or what? Activity, maybe? Kind of like temperature, activity. Those are like two guesses. Those are definitely some good guesses. Uh, in this case, the color has to do with how deep or how shallow uh, this part of the map is. So purple and blue, that cool end of the rainbow, those are the deepest areas. And then as you go up the mountains, these are two underwater mountains. Um, and in this case, they've broken through. You can see the little green spot in the middle. They've broken through the, the surface. But um, the more yellow and red it gets, the higher up it gets toward the surface of the ocean. So this is the kind of map that we're making. And you can see the detail that's in there. If you look at this blue spot, like all around, this is the detail that we had. It's not very good, huh? We can't see a lot of detail yeah, in that I, map. Yeah, I can just see water on the blue yeah. spots. Water yeah. is blue. So yeah. we didn't have a good idea of the shape of the planet. Um, and now, because we're doing this mapping, we do, and we can understand it a lot better. Actually, you want to talk about sonar a little bit? Yeah, so as we are traveling, um, every time we transit, we are mapping new areas of the seafloor that we haven't mapped to this resolution before. And so, just like Chris said, we're basically getting a much better picture of what the floor looks like as we go along. And so, before we go down with the ROVs, with our, our underwater robots, every time, we like to make sure that we have a little bit of an idea of how deep we should go or what interesting things we're going to see. And so we have this great sensor um, on the bottom of the ship that sends out sound. And when that sound hits the floor, it echoes back. And if the sound comes back really fast, then we know that there might be a mountain there, that it's a little more shallow. If the sound comes back a little bit slowly, then we know it's deeper. And so we send these signals out really, really fast and we read them back really, really fast and we do it over a large area with a lot of different beeps at the same time. And so these beeps actually help us paint this picture. And then when we see something really exciting like a ridge or a peak of a mountain, we talk to our scientists and the scientists say, oh yeah, I think I found some really cool things on a peak of a mountain like this before let's send down the ROVs in this spot. So that's how we pick out our, our locations and our way marks as we call them. And we plan our dives around those. Do you so, ever find, so I can only imagine when you send down the ROV, the amazing things that you find down there just naturally, but have you ever found things you didn't expect to find, man-made things, either shipwrecks or planes or something? That has happened. Um, of the above, I think. Yeah, one of the, the founders of this organization, his name is Robert Ballard. He is very famous for finding the Titanic. I mean, he was looking for it, so he sort of knew it was about where it was going to be. But um, his organization uh, found the, the Titanic and was able to go down with robots and take lots of pictures. And um, it's, it's been a, sort of the, one of the highlights of his career uh, that he's very well known for. But they, they find Very things cool. all the time um, on the dives. Um, sometimes we find man-made things like trash. Uh, both of the dives, we've had two dives so far. And on the first one, we found some green uh, fishnet. And then last night we found a big long rope that had just gone down a mile or two down in the ocean. I mean, we're talking really deep where people have never been before, but they've washed in the currents and ended up in our protected areas here. So, oh. oh yeah, so if you'd like to show the ROV, sounds great. So this is Hercules. He is our main ROV. He does all of the fine work and all of the hard work down at the bottom of the sea floor. And so Hercules is made out of aluminum. He's got these big yellow blocks on top that make him 
uh, heavy on land, but light in the water. It's called syntactic foam. And it's built so that when he goes under um, water to deep, deep pressures, the foam won't get crushed, um, but it will add buoyancy. And so this big, heavy thing that weighs 5,500 pounds on land, when it's underwater becomes neutrally buoyant and a little bit positively buoyant so that if we lose control, it'll slowly float up to the surface. Um, Hercules is outfitted with a number of cameras, I think five or six cameras, including um, ones that look at some of the instruments and gauges so we can check on Hercules's status and health while he's deep down on the bottom of the ocean. Um, he also has a bunch of sensors to collect data about oxygen, temperature, salinity, that means like how much um, salt there is in the water. And uh, he also has the coolest thing ever, which is a bionic arm that we control from here inside the control room that you've seen us in. And the way we control this arm is actually with a little device that looks like a miniature arm and we unfold it and manipulate it and move it around as though we were on the seafloor trying to pick something up. And with that, we can take samples. So yesterday, I think we took so many samples of things like um, some corals, some sea sponges, we got a lot of rocks because we have geologists on board who keep telling us to get rocks and we'd rather, you know, maybe pick up a pretty sea star instead. <laughs> and the arm can also use uh, tools. And so we have some things like a knife in case Hercules needs to cut himself free. We've got a big sucker as well, a big suction tube where sometimes the hand can grab the suction tube and hold it up against a sponge or a cool little fish and just suck that thing right up into a sample tube and store it in water until we're back on the surface. Um, back behind well, Hercules. Oh, go ahead. I'm glad you explained the arm because we watched a little bit last night when you were collecting some coral and the pilot was talking that, you know, that your team is talking the whole time. And, and um, she mentioned that uh, she was having a little bit of difficulty because she's left-handed, but I guess the arm is right-handed. So I wasn't quite sure what that meant, but now that you explained it, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> you can see the, the arm right here. This is, it's sort of folded in half for storage. And so it's on the, if you're looking from the ROV's perspective, it is on the right side. It is completely right-handed. And the device that we use is set up for right-handers as well. The funny thing is, so we always have two ROVs in the water. You'll see Argus back in the left side of this picture. Um, we always have two pilots and two ROVs in the water. Our, Argus's main duty is to absorb the shock as the ship moves around and gets bounced in the waves. Um, that gets sent down the tether, the power line and the communications line all the way to Argus. And Argus absorbs most of that shock. And that way Hercules, yeah which is attached to Argus by another tether, can do the fine work without getting jerked around as he's trying to grab things off the seafloor. Um, so it's funny because the Hercules pilot, who's usually the, the more advanced pilot, we have three Herc pilots on board, he'll work on flying Hercules. And then when he needs help, because Argus, or in our case, Atalanta, which is a similar ROV, is a little bit easier to fly, um, that that pilot, the Argus pilot, will help with Hercules. So we'll open boxes or turn on lights or read from sensors or do the arm. But all of the Argus pilots on this mission are left-handed. <laughs> so the arm work <laughs> is not as natural as it might look at any given point. Not natural. Not natural. <laughs> So we have a great uh, crew that maintains Argus and maintains Hercules. And there's so many parts, this animation shows all the parts that go into building an ROV, starting with the frame. Yeah, you can't even count them, there's so many. And every single one needs to be working perfectly in order for our missions to be successful. So one little mistake, you know, the camera's not working right or the one thruster isn't working right and we have to scrap the, the launch and fix it and start over again. So it's really pretty uh, highly technical and 
but we have folks that really understand it well. And so when things go wrong, they can know exactly what to do. Yeah, on this mission, we actually had an issue with Argus that you're looking at here. Um, one of the, actually both of the thrusters burned out and stopped working and we have, we've yet to figure out why. It's a little bit hard to work on detailed electronics when you're at sea. <laughs> There's a lot of heaving around. It's kind of like being in the machine shop and someone's always running over to push you over every five seconds, Alex. <laughs> it's pretty funny. And so we went with a different ROV. We have a couple of um, mini backups here on board. And so you'll hear us talking about Atalanta instead of Argus if you keep watching for the next 20 days that we're at sea. Yeah. So, so how long have you been at sea so far? Has it been a week? It's been a week now. It's been yeah, a week. We, we left last <laughs> Wednesday. Is that right? Something. I think yeah. So. Been a, definitely my longest time at sea, as you can imagine. Didn't have a lot of sea time growing up in Lubbock, Texas. No. <laughs> so when we launch, uh, Hercules and Argus are both very heavy. Hercules weighs about 5,500 pounds, and so people can't pick it up. So we have these big cranes on the back of the ship. The yellow one we call the banana crane. Can you guess why? <laughs> I, I think it's, it's because it's yellow you got it you got it and uh the other crane this is the one the white crane is the one that we've been using um mostly to launch hercules hercules rolls out i don't know if you can see this little sort of x-shaped thing this is what um, hercules sits on and it picks the white crane picks it up and leans it over the side like this and slowly drops that one into the water first and then argus goes in second and then we have them behind the ship. Um, and so this is a picture at, at night. And you can see this, the water looks very different right around Hercules. Can you tell what it's doing? Um, Why is the... I don't know. It, That's a light. Yeah, it's got a lot of lights on it. And the reason it needs lights is because in the deep ocean where we're exploring, there is no light. The sun can't shine there because it has to go through all that water, a mile or two of water, and the sun just sort of fizzles out. And when by the time you get to the bottom, if we didn't have those lights, we wouldn't be able to see anything. We wouldn't know where we were going. So we need a lot of bright lights on Hercules. And this is what Hercules looks like. This is a picture from Argus looking down on Hercules. And so Hercules is right on the, on the seafloor taking some samples and examining what's down there. That is some brave piloting to get into that crack. It sure is. It looks who. like it. <laughs> yeah. So, so is it all the same to y'all? If whether it's uh, working during the day or at night, y'all don't y'all y'all will launch at any time. Yep. We will. I think um, we've got we've had more midnight launches planned recently than morning launches. We stay on like a the crew all stays on a what do you call it, a four hour shift or a watch schedule. So when we really have operations going smoothly, we each take four hours and we rotate. And so we all end up getting a total of eight hours a day. Um, but it's just 24 seven operations to keep this thing going because it is expensive to be out here. Sure is. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> when we get to the well, bottom, oh, sorry, Alex, go ahead. What were you gonna say? So. Uh, I, I really hope you you have like hundred million dollars or something like that. You can pay. You can. <laughs> it costs quite a lot of money to have a ship like this. This is not a an inexpensive ship. So they they raised I don't know if it's a hundred million, but they raised millions of dollars to uh, get this ship, and they need to keep raising money to have it run every year. We get some money from the government, um, so they help us out, and there's some other organizations that. Uh, have some interests on the seafloor that will give us funding so that we can have all these people. We have 50 people on the ship all working. And so we have to pay not just for the ship, but for all the people who are working. We eat a lot. And we eat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we <don't go> <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so when we go down to the bottom, um, a lot of people think we're going to see whales and fish and we do see some uh, things that have backbones, but most of the things we find are creatures that don't have a backbone. We call those an invertebrate. Have you ever heard that word before? Yeah, I know that word. 
Awesome. What about vertebrates and invertebrates? <laughs> Some of our invertebrates look like they're aliens. They're absolutely crazy looking. And I'm gonna the things I'm gonna show you are all animals. They might even look like a plant, but they're an animal. Check this out. He just learned about invertebrates and vertebrates. Oh, Excellent. Good time. And that's an animal? This is an animal. I did not know that was an animal. Yeah. I've seen this picture before and had no idea. Yeah, you can that's see each of, the, each of these little sort of bumps with hairs on it. On the, if you look, just pick one strand, you see those little hairs. Each one of those is a little mouth with tentacles and it's grabbing food out of the, out of the ocean. What's, what's its name? Um, this one is, I should know it. <laughs> I want to say it's a crinoid, but I could be wrong on that one. Oh, well, I would never know. <laughs> I, I think, I think it's a crinoid, but I could be, I could be wrong on that one. Chris, I give you full permission kind of to make up okay. names for Neil because uh, this is an elephant. <laughs> no, it's not an elephant. It's, a, it's an All ocean right. tumbleweed. Is what it is. <laughs> this one might be a little more familiar to you, right? We have a fish here. Um, the fish down in the deep ocean are often really scary looking. They don't have the pretty colors that you might see in your fish tank at home. Um, they have a lot of gray and black and red colors. And a lot of their bodies are really long and skinny like this. Um, there are some that are not long and skinny, but many of them that we have been seeing uh, as we've been doing our dives have, have had that long skinny body structure. So they don't look like a a trout or a salmon or something you might catch when you go fishing most of the time. And right behind this fish, this big sort of greenish thing, any idea what that might be? What does that look like, the big green thing? Hmm. I don't know. This is a living sponge. Did you know that sponges were alive? The ones that you have in your kitchen probably are not alive. They're probably plastic ones, <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is actually an animal <laughs> called a sponge and sponges don't move around they don't have any arms or legs or flippers or eyes or anything they're very simple organisms but what they do is they just suck water in take all the little pieces of food that are floating around in the water eat that and they spit the water back out again and they just do that constantly they're called filter feeders and behind that okay, are... you can ask questions yeah go for it out to interrupt ask. anytime if you, if okay, so, so so are fish attracted to rubber lights? To the rubber lights? I don't know if they're I don't know if they're attracted, but I think some sometimes there's some uh, lights down in the deep that do attract organisms. But when we have our big bright lights on, the fish don't seem to go toward it or away from it usually. Yeah, I think every once in a while, a really curious creature will come check it out. But most of the time, um, they don't seem to mind very much. I don't even know if some of them can see color or Is see that, light. That might know. be possible as well. That makes sense. Okay. So an, we'll, save, we'll save it later. That one just there's fits. another it's animal like in this picture. These ones in the back that look like trees. These really don't look like animals, but these are actually animals. Those are corals. And a coral is similar to the spiral shaped one that we saw before, but they have a, a hard shell that they make that grows in this tree pattern. And they have little tiny mouths. There's a whole bunch of organisms. It's not just one creature. It's actually a colony of creatures that all lives together. They're really, really tiny. And they grab things out of the water with their little tentacles and uh, they grow very slowly. Some of these corals can be 4,000 years old on the bottom of the sea. That's how slow they grow. They just grow and. That's, that's older than that. Yeah. And it can be, but barely. It can be older since of the, than the world. They're, they're older than our understanding of science, really, uh, which is pretty fascinating. Here's another one. It's a big rock full of coral. And this is a sponge. I guess, I guess they don't need sunlight for, for their they growth. Don't. No, um, most ecosystems on our planet do need sunlight. They need uh, photosynthesis so that they can make some food. But the things down at the bottom of the ocean, they depend on a few different things. One is just food that falls down from the surface. Um, so dead things that fall down, they, they filter that out. That's why we have a lot of these really simple filtering organisms. 
Um, and in some areas, not the one that we are at, there are some chemicals that come out of the ground that um, bacteria can use to uh, make food instead of using sunlight like they usually do. So we won't see any plants or any seaweed um, down at the bottom of the ocean. It's mostly just animals and bacteria that are down here. This is a big sponge and you can see, you can look at Hercules. Hercules is taller than me, right? It's about as, as wide as my wingspan. And you can see how big that sponge is compared to Hercules. It's on a big long stalk like that. So it sticks up in the water so we can get lots of food. Last night we saw one like that, Alex. It was kind of close to that. It didn't have the long stalk and we used the sucker and we put the, the sucker tube up against the sponge and we just sucked parts right off of it. It was like we'd taken giant bites out of this huge sponge. It was so weird. <laughs> it made me want to go touch it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <It's right now. laughs> so you mentioned about some of the, the bacteria and things. You you come across a lot of thermal vents down there and does that change what you find a lot or not in that in, area? In this area, we don't see any. These are uh, sort of former volcanic areas. So the, the rock is like lava rock that's down there, but there's no active mm -hmm. volcano going on. So these were active probably 75 to 100 million years ago. So it was a long time ago that, that these rocks were formed. But there are other parts of the ocean that we've explored in, in previous years where there are um, hydrothermal vents, where there are methane seeps, places where methane gas just bubbles out of the ground. Um, so we do have those areas and the, the colonies that live around there are very unique. Yeah, that was, I think, one of so even though Dr. Ballard is known for discovering the Titanic, I think he is most proud of discovering some of the microbes and microorganisms around um, the thermal vents because they're supposed to carry some of the earliest signs of uh, life on Earth. And so even now, um, one of our uh, geologists on board and biologists is looking for uh, microbes that kind of point to the same types of I don't know, information or, you know, old, old information from creatures that used to live around these thermal vents. And the rocks that we have here are covered with metals. They have a coating of metal of um, iron and magnesium mostly. Um, no, not magnesium, manganese. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Important difference. Um, but uh, Beth is studying how those bacteria might be part of the um, crusting process or how they uh, might absorb some of those uh, metal materials from the water. Here's another picture of some stuff that we've seen. I oh, don't wow. know all the things in this picture, but they just look like aliens. Uh, I think it's just amazing how different this part of the ocean is from when you go to the beach. Like you don't see any of this stuff at the beach. What's the the little spidery thing? Is that a is that a that, spider or is it a right snake? here? A yeah, spider. that looks like a right. brittle star, maybe. It's either a brittle star or a, a simple crinoid, one of the two. Okay, I have a question. Go for um, it. What's what's that? What's that um, horse shaped thing in the back with the head? With the head thing in the um, background, you can see back that. here. Yep, that is right. Yeah, right there. That is a sponge. One of those living sponges like we looked at in the other picture. Good they question. Of, okay, okay. All shapes and sizes. Thank you for seeing horse. Yeah. <laughs> it's like they bird watching. It, it's like bird watching. It's just sponge watching. The scientists here gave us um, what we call the wish list. And as we're floating around, part of the way we collect data is just by looking at things. And so we've got a crew of scientists on board and at shore who all share the same wish list for one of the uh, scientists who we're doing this expedition for. And so every time we see a new creature, we'll kind of go down and it's like a scavenger hunt looking for just various sea creatures that he's interested in studying. So I think we went by like six or seven different sea stars last night until we found the one that wasn't smooth, but didn't have the pointy nodes, but then it had these little rounded bumps <laughs> on it and they all look the same to us because they they don't all necessarily have classifications or names yet. Some of them do and some don't. And it really is like a, a complete scavenger hunt or like playing car bingo or something. Yeah. You guys must play great charades. 
<laughs> guess so. Uh, yeah, we have a great team of scientists on the ship, but we also have our team of scientists on land. And so as we're at the bottom of the ocean, they're watching live on the internet, uh, seeing exactly what we're seeing, and they're typing in comments and saying, oh, give me a sample of one of those, or, oh, I know what that is, that's this. We have lots of those already, we don't need it. So it's kind of cool to have members of your team that aren't even here, but they're able to help us make decisions on what we collect. Um, this fish right here might look kind of like a shark. Um, it's related to sharks, this is called a chimera. Actually, some people call it a ghost shark, but um, the proper name for it is a chimera. And it's kind of like a shark, except sharks usually have lots of gills on the sides of their head, and chimeras only have just one gill opening. Um, which makes them a little different from sharks. They also, um, you can see these lines that go around the body. It kind of looks like they're sewn together like Frankenstein. They have a really kind of creepy look to them and usually have a funny nose shape as well. Yeah, the eyes don't help, do they? No. <laughs> so Alex has a question about its eyes. Uh, it, I, is it blind or can it see? That's a good question. Um, I think these can see. They probably don't depend exclusively on <clears throat> on their eyes because it is so dark down there. But there are things that light up, um, and so the shark may or the chimera may be able to uh, use little bits of light that it sees to help it find things that it can eat. We did have one come kind of dance around the ROV last night. Yeah, a that big was one great. that lingered for a while. So it might have. Yeah, maybe that one saw the light a little bit. And I bet it was responding to the light for sure. So oh, in this, this area of the ocean, yeah. oh, wow. wow. In, in this area of the ocean, do you come across places that are so deep that it's too deep for the rover? Yes. Do we? Um, I think we can go down deeper than the seafloor here. Oh, and there, this... there are other places in the ocean that are too deep for our rovers. I did hear that we passed over a few areas that we mapped that were kind of just holes. Oh. And okay. so there, there might be a couple of areas where usually you set a maximum depth on your echo sounder. You kind of tune it for a range. If your depth is just set to infinity, the rest of the readings you get back aren't as good. And so I did hear from some of the navigators that when they were mapping, we hit a couple of holes um, that exceeded our maximum depth. So maybe the Hercules can go down to 4,000 meters. And Argus and Atalanta are actually a little bit um, sturdier and they have fewer sensors on board that are limiting factors. So they can go down to 6,000 meters. Um, we don't usually send those down alone because when you go down to 6,000 meters, it's nice to look and you can see some things, but usually we're collecting samples and want a little bit more information. And so um, we use Hercules for all of that work. So this is a big worm. Uh, it's called a squid worm. And instead of little feet, it's got flippers. So it, it's actually a swimming worm. When you say big, it's tough to do a sense of scale about how big is this? I don't know how big this one is. Um, I haven't seen many of these. Um, I haven't seen any myself uh, during dives, but um, online, I've, I've only seen one or two. So. I, I don't know the scale on this one. Darn it, Chris, you beat me. I was I was going to tell Neil it was the size of his house and he should worry every oh, time he hears right. something. <laughs> Neil, no, just listen to Chris. Okay, I got it. <laughs> A little bit of so, payback. <laughs> one of the things that we, we do have on Hercules is we have these two lasers that shoot straight out and um, they're 10 centimeters apart. So it makes two little green dots. And if you can see those two green dots, you know what 10 centimeters looks like at whatever distance we are. Because sometimes we zoom in, sometimes we're zoomed out. So it's kind of hard to gauge sizes just based on the picture. Um, so if this had the green dots right. in it, we could give you a much better answer with this one. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's a neat trick. I like yeah, that. that big sponge that we rolled up on last night that we suckered off a piece of. Um, when we were first looking at it, I was driving Argus and I thought that maybe the whole thing was like the size of a football. It just kind of conceptually looked like I could hold it in my hands pretty easily. And then we put the sucker up 
and started sucking off pieces. And what we pulled off was probably the size of like a golf ball or tennis ball and it didn't make a dent. This thing was like a meter, meter and a half wide. Yeah. So oh, yeah, those lasers really come in handy because even when you're driving by things, the sense of scale, just your depth perception just isn't there. Yeah, oh, yeah. it's really helpful. Yeah. And all the cameras are just sort of one shot cameras. You know, we're used to seeing with two eyes and it's easier to tell distance when you have two eyes looking at something. But with the camera, um, you only have the one one eye looking at any given picture. So yeah. it's hard to gauge the depth and how, how deep or far away things are. Yeah. Do you guys want to keep looking at pictures or do you have other questions and, and any other directions? I have, like to go? I have I have a couple of questions. All right. I thought maybe uh, you would have prepared a couple. I have four questions. Got like here. And we've asked one, but you can start with number one. I'll start with number one. What's your favorite thing you have seen so far? You want to go first? Yeah. Um, I saw a really neat crab that it puts these things that are kind of like anemones. They're called zoanthids. Um, it has the, them on its back. And so this crab is walking around with another organism, a soft, squishy organism with tentacles um, sitting on its back. And uh, they help each other. The, the zoanthid, or at least the crab helps the zoanthid. I don't know if the zoanthid helps the crab. <laughs> but when the crab eats things, it is kind of a messy eater. It pulls things apart with its, um, with its claws. And so little pieces of food go up in the air. And those zoanthids can snatch it right out of the air. Yeah, I think my favorite cool. thing. Yeah, we have. Oh, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I was just saying that the, the uh, animal cooperation is something he has for his science class. So that's a great example. He'll be the only one that uh, turns in that answer. So, <laughs> so <laughs> if I could spell Zoanthid, we'll just say. <laughs> <laughs> I think we saw go one ahead, last Ashton, night. Sorry. Oh, no worries. I, we saw one of. Um, the crabs that Chris was talking about last night, I missed it, but we should have a video up in the next couple of weeks. He can show his class too. Um, mm -hmm. There's one already on the Nautilus website from a while ago, I think called like crab carries its best friend, like a backpack or something. <laughs> um, my favorite thing I think I saw last night, which was an enormous, like mm -hmm. probably two meter wide bubble gum coral. It was this fluorescent hot pink, and it was infested with snake stars. So they look like underwater tentacly snakes, and they were just tentacles, like coming in and out of this hot pink coral. It was just a crazy mix of colors to come across, and it looked so creepy in this like bright, happy way. <laughs> That's so cool. watching you two, you're both sort of moving like this periodically. I'm guessing the oh, ship yeah. is, is rocking. Oh, very much. <laughs> I found that crab that I was talking about. <laughs> okay. And we're at the well, highest um, point. <laughs> Alex, do you want to see the crab I was talking about? Yes. yes. Let's see Let me show you. First you, can you can ask your question. Oh! It's right there. That was yeah, my it, question. Where was it? And it's there got it this, is. That's a big backpack. <laughs> yeah. So it's got six oh. different little mouths on it that are all feeding on what the crab has for leftovers. That's a major backpack. You your beer and back all day. <laughs> <laughs> I would really love to. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Your next okay. question. Okay, so question number two. How do operations change when the weather, when he, it says he weather uh, is bad? Taco from dad, yeah. When the weather's bad. When the weather's bad, it's not he weather bad. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, dad. <laughs> That's a really good question. What are your thoughts? Let's listen to the answer, buddy. That's a great question. So we had some bad weather this week, and you saw that map where we were going to go from the southeast up to the northwest. Um, we basically just had to go all the way through the storm. And so what we did was and we stopped our watch schedules for a few days. Everybody just got a lot of sleep and ate a lot of food and read a lot of books. And um, except for the crew who were working hard and um, we just charged through the storm and went 
as far as we could until we were out of it and safe because when we put those ROVs over the side, we need it to be really calm. Um, if it's bumpy at all or, you know, the ship is listing back and forth, it gets really dangerous and it's hard for us to control the ROVs. So, yeah, we just, what do we do? Played some board games. There were a lot of cards. Yeah. I saw some people playing cribbage. Um, we had some uh, science meetings or people, you know, oh, yeah. training other people. Well, that was more while we were transiting yeah, uh, to our so. first spot. But um, a lot of people also weren't feeling so great yes. through the storm. And oh, so oh. we usually just send everyone to bed and yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the, the best jobs okay. I've ever had. <laughs> we get naps. Yeah. yeah so many naps. <laughs> since we did since we did question number three, our fish fish tractor rubber lights, we're gonna go to question number four. Does anybody ever fish off, off the back of the ship? I've heard that that happens. Yeah. So oh. on all the other cruises I've been on, the crew will go out and they'll catch some like mahi mahi. They'll, you know, try to get some tuna or something. I haven't seen it, but Easter's coming up. So I was really hoping that they might catch something for dinner. Maybe. We have some extra restrictions when we're in the National Monument. Um, so we're only allowed to take food for sustenance. So if we're not going to eat it, we can't catch it pretty much. Now we're outside the monument. And so I'm not sure if the rules, some of the rules are, are still applying to us. Or we're we're holding to ourselves, but I'm not sure if that is the case or not. But I, I would not be surprised if we got some fish pulled in. We actually saw some fish when we were launching Hercules a few days ago in the lights. There were some big um mahi, mahi I think, yeah. that were eating little flying fish. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I thought that was just gonna be a silly question, but they actually get some fish. Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> Most of our crew right now is Ukrainian, and a lot of them have been telling stories about fishing on the Black Sea and sailing on the Black Sea back home. So it's kind of cool. That's we have a lot of right. good Ukrainian dishes um, for dinner and Eastern European soups and things. It's We are eating well, even if we're not eating a lot of fish. Yeah. What are some of the other countries represented on the ship? We have at least one guy from Canada. We have a guy crew. from... Oman, Oman yeah. one of our, yeah, yeah the, one of our navigators. Silver. And um, I think the captain's Irish. Yes, the captain's very Irish. Oh, we also, um, one of the <laughs> Irish mates yeah. is from Romania. Yeah, and um, yeah. there's a guy from Panama who's the second mate. And... Oh, and my roommate is from Guam. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. They probably all have some fantastic stories of all of their journeys and stories yeah. from home. We have okay. a lady on board who is an Antarctic explorer and she's been to Antarctica like eight or nine times now. She used to be, I think like an art teacher and a middle school teacher. And she uh, totally did like a career shift. And now she's an Antarctic explorer. It's pretty amazing. Yes, sir. Uh, Are you, you? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, um, my question, my question is, even though this is not ship, ship related, is I think that the U Ukraine people, mostly Ukraine people, just came on the ship to avoid to avoid getting attacked by Russia, since Ukraine's being attacked. Well, by that's Russia. probably not why they're there, but it probably makes it really difficult for them to be away from home. So I think they were there yeah. before the war started. Yeah, I think um, it's hard yeah. for a lot of them right now. Yeah. So that's yep, yeah, they left the port world. <laughs> so there's so many disciplines on board. First of all, the conversations must be amazing. But yeah. <laughs> are there also how do things get prioritized? Somebody wants samples of this, but somebody else needs over here. Is it is there a chief science officer in charge or something or? We do we have two call? lead scientists and they're sort of each focused on their own research. One is a geologist and one is a microbiologist. And then we also have our uh, other scientists ashore and we've got a, uh, what is Dwight's job? Uh, I think he is the science manager. Science manager. Basically. Yeah, the expedition yeah. manager. With yeah, the expedition science. leader, I think yeah. that's, yeah. So, so, and he is the one that coordinates with the captain and decides where we can dive 
what our priorities are for each uh, dive that we do. So we get a whole report printed out uh, before every dive that we do um, saying, you know, this is where we want to go from here to here if possible. Um, it often doesn't go as planned. So we often change that plan in, in the middle, depending on weather, depending on what we're finding. Um, and they'll remind us too, I found when we're when we're flying around, um, there are clear science objectives, but sometimes we're just in an area that's better for rocks or we're in an area that's better for the microorganisms or the not microorganisms they're looking for. And so occasionally we'll get a call or a message from land that's like, take a water sample for me. Don't forget my water sample. Or, you know, right. can you go pick that, pick up that rock over there? It's time for me to get a rock. And so they're, they've balanced it really well. Um, but yeah. we have a clear dive plan and clear objectives before every, every launch. Um, uh, apart from that, um, speaking to like the different disciplines on board, it's really cool. We've got a big team of scientists, then we have a small team of ROV engineers, and then we have um, everyone who's more in the communications, videography, um, science communication, and education side. And so I kind of like to think of it as the science is the why we're out here. The ROVs are the how we're getting the samples, how we're getting the data, and then the science and communicate or the communication and education outreach is like why it matters. You know, they, they actually share the findings and will make it relevant to the world. So it, there's a lot of mutual respect and a lot of um, good collaboration, I think, to, to like a really surprising amount. There's really not tension between teams. It's a, it's really collaborative and respectful. Yeah, it's one of the things I've what really appreciated. Guys... Say that yeah, again. No, I was getting ready to say no. Just listening to you, Ashton, and you know, just thinking about how amazing what you're doing is, and how perhaps few people get the opportunity to do what you're doing. It's just absolutely amazing, and all the things that you're seeing for the first time, and you know, the gaps in our understanding that you're filling, just amazing that just to, you know, think about the magnitude of what you're doing, the importance. Yeah, thank you so much for letting us know about this program and getting a chance to see this. I mean, it's, it's uh, the, the setup of just that is impressive. Yeah. So I can only imagine all the rest of it. And okay, Ashton, it's just you. great seeing you out there doing amazing things. Yeah. So we really enjoyed that part too. Thank you. It is so special for me to talk to all of you. It's so special for me to talk to you, Alex, because I knew your dad since before I was younger than you are. So <laughs> I am happy to happy to connect with you guys in this way. Definitely never expected I would be speaking to you from a ship in the Pacific. This is <laughs> a really cool My dad is really 50 years old. <laughs> My dad's hey, hey, Chris, where are you from originally? I'm from New Hampshire. I'm a middle school oh, science okay. teacher, so my principal oh, gave me a whole month off of school, and here I am. How, how awesome is, is that? And, and, a, and a whole lot of deep sea shore for in New Hampshire as well. It's just like Lubbock. Yeah. <laughs> well, they do. Have <laughs> same thing. Well, actually, New Hampshire has about 17 miles of coastline, and I live about two hours away from that 17 miles of coastline, <laughs> so I'm, I don't know why. I was a marine bio major, and then I settled on the other side of the state somehow. So. <laughs> Chris is really cool because he um, is fluent in American Sign Language as well. And so he's been able to speak to a lot of deaf schools from the ship, which is a first time for them, which is really cool. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That's yeah. Amazing. Okay. Well, yeah, thank you been, so much for the time. Thank you. It's been awesome what to talk perfect. with you all. Definitely. Thanks, Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. It was good to meet you. Be careful. You too. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks for uh, all the great questions. You bet. Aloha. Right, Aloha. <laughs> Thank you, Ashton and Chris. To find out more about the Nautilus and the educational programs it offers, including watching live feeds, visit nautiluslive.org.